Howdy, Heard. We are going back to the 5th century. Did I get it right that time, Seth? Yes, 5th century. Not the 4th century. They weren't eating this for another 100 years. 5th <laughs> century, we're going back in time. Absolutely, it's key to get the right century for Parthian chicken. So I think this is the first time we've done something historical on the show. Oh, it's on your end. You've got me playing. I do. Time we've done something historical on the show. Oh, it's on your end. You've got me playing. I do. There we go. I think we're good. All right. Well, also, our knowledge of technology is in the fifth century. Te technology is amazing. Every day we are blessed. Hey, I mean, for Christ's sake, for the last two years. Hey, you're on mute. I'm teasing. No, that's just like every meeting. <laughs> you never know. One of my friends uh, was on a call and had a, uh, a rather loud argument with a friend, with her uh, fiance. And she thought she had hit mute. And what she had done was hit mute on the keyboard. And so we all got to hear it. At least it was a social call. It wasn't a work call, but ugh, stuff's dangerous. Yeah, no, I'm uh, very cautious about uh, whenever I step away for something, I double mute my computer and my microphone to make sure that there are no mistakes. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's better to just to throw it in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for those of you following along at home, uh, the recipe is on the show page. And first key question, since this show is not only about bringing something delicious to your kitchen, but making the world better at the same time, Seth, today's charity. Uh, Society for Professional Journalism, uh, Journalists. <laughs> uh, as a recently uh, ex-journalist, um, uh, journal the the act of committing the, the committing acts of journalism journalism is very important to me. Um, I feel like uh, in in this day and age, we uh, really struggle with getting uh, the truth out, but we also struggle with speaking truth to power, and that's something that journalism. Uh, at its best, does very well. Uh, SPJ is uh, one of the best organizations in the world that helps uh, further that cause. And um, I, you know, strongly uh, uh, encourage everyone who has the ability to uh, give them a few dollars. And how do they donate? Oh, go to their website, spj.org. Okay. Yeah. All right. This recipe definitely is going to be a little bit different because I did not have some of the one of the key ingredients. Um, however, from Natalie the other week where we did the Ayurvedic cooking, which happened to include kitchri spices. And the last ingredient on it is asafoetida, which is how I was able to show up and do this because Seth did not turn his recipe in on time. Um, but key thing here is everybody's recipe looks different. Both are going to be delicious and yeah. yours is going to be different at home. Seth is going to talk through some substitutes for what is a pretty esoteric herb uh, yeah. that is not commonly seen in the United States. And hashtag unicorn chef, show us what you're making, because even if it's different, we still want to see it. Seth, kick us yeah. off. With what are you drinking? Yes. So uh, tonight I am drinking uh, what I call a, a Oaxacan uh, Sazerac. Um, it is... Uh, basically a Sazerac, but made with tequila and um, mezcal and uh, a touch more absinthe than the standard Sazerac, but um, gets the job done. Uh, lacked a garnish, didn't feel like cutting up a jalapeno, so uh, here we are, but it's quite tasty. Um, proportions are one and a half ounces of tequila to half an ounce of uh, mezcal to a quarter of an ounce at the most of uh, absinthe. And then uh, da two dashes each of two of these three bitters, chocolate, uh, cardamom, uh, and orange. Out of curiosity, why not just go with all mezcal? Uh, could. Certainly could. Um, but the tequila gives it a, a slightly smoother base. And it, I, don't want, I didn't want the smokiness to be super overpowering. Um, I, I do love my smoky drinks. Um, I've got uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, PD scotches, um, but it felt like it needed a little bit of balance when I was playing around last night with it. So here we go. Yeah. With that said, 
Um, let's dive into the recipe. So the recipe actually comes from another YouTuber, uh, uh, Tasting History with Max Miller. I just want to be sure we credit him for it. Um, and uh, his video on this is called The Strange Flavor of Parthian Chicken from Ancient Rome. Um, it's a uh, fairly simple recipe, which is one of the things that I like about it. Um, and if you can think back to what things to what time it must have been like in the fifth century, uh, it you know they didn't have a lot of fancy kitchen implements. They also didn't have a lot of fancy uh, cooking uh, ability. Um, controlling the heat over a fire was uh, challenging. Um, and so what I like about this is you prepare the chicken, you throw it over the fire, and you wait and you check it, and then it's done. Um, that all being said, uh, let's get to the recipe itself. Um, so first off, uh, if you uh, haven't spatchcocked your chicken, do it really, really quickly. Um, just go write you know, Terminator for it and, and rip that spine out. For those of you who need pointers, uh, we did an episode last year with Trevor and Alyssa, mm -hmm. uh, where I actually taught the, the show and uh, taught them how to spatchcock a chicken. Uh, that show is best known for watching Alyssa smack a chicken because she was intimidated by it. <laughs> was it alive? Uh, it's like all of it. Yeah, it's shot live. And it's, it's no, I mean, was the chicken animal. alive? Did she slap it live? Oh, no, it wasn't alive. No, we didn't. I didn't show how to kill a chicken, to, to, you know, take out the feathers. I yes. just showed how to spatchcock a chicken. Yes, good. The, the best part about spatchcocking a chicken is when you uh, smack it down and flatten it so its sternum doesn't... Uh, get in the way. So once you've done that, presuming you've done that, one of the uh, interesting things about this chicken is because it's spatchcocked, if you do it in advance about, you know, a day or a night before, you don't have to worry so much about crisping up the skin. Uh, simply do it the night before, throw it in the fridge, and that extra little bit of dryness will make the skin crisp up when you put it in the oven. You don't have to do anything extra. Um, certainly you don't have to do that. You could be spatchcocking right now as I run my mouth, but, uh, presuming you've done that, the next step, uh, make sure your oven's preheated, uh, 450 Fahrenheit, uh, or 230, uh, Celsius for people who enjoy using real numbers, um, not freedom digits. And then, uh, we have a bunch of ingredients. And uh, they're fairly basic things. Uh, black pepper, uh, lovage or celery leaf. I should be grabbing these and showing them to you. So uh, black pepper, everybody's best friend. Uh, here we have on Janky Cam uh, a bit of black pepper that I've just ground. And then we also have uh, lovage or celery leaf. I used celery for this one. Bryson's got his there. Um, on the uh, chicken that I'll be showing at the end, I actually wound up using uh, cilantro. Um, so really any kind of leafy uh, a garnish that you have that uh, you, know, you, you, you enjoy. Um, cilantro is gonna have a very different flavor profile than celery leaf, but still it'll add something to it. Um, you're going to need, uh, let me check, I believe it's three tablespoons of fish sauce. Uh, the recipe itself calls for a slightly more esoteric version of fish sauce, uh, garum or liquamen, um, but Asian fish sauce will do just as well. A colatura di alizi will also do. Yeah, that's, um, that's Italian. Um, I've actually been interested in that ingredient for a couple of years, but it's really hard to find. I mm -hmm. mean, a specialty Italian stores looking for it. Um, yeah. If I recall correctly, it's um, pressed uh, sardine oil, mm -hmm. hence fish sauce, like which you can commonly find in an Asian market is similar. Right, absolutely. You can also press your the sardines yourself, but taking up time. Uh, you also will need uh, one and a half teaspoons of uh, caraway seeds. I don't know if they're gonna show up too clearly on Janky Cam here. Here we go, bam. Um, easy to find, uh, and they add quite a nice flavor to the chicken. And then we have, uh, oh, we have wine. We'll need one cup of wine. 
here we are. You can use red or white. Um, I chose red, it's gonna add a little bit of a nicer color to the chicken. Um, and also I just prefer cooking with red over white. So if you wanna use a rosé, I'm sure it's fine too. No one's gonna critique you for that. <laughs> just about anything alcoholic will work. Well, yeah, basically. Um, I mean, you could try grappa. I don't know if that's gonna have the right- I wouldn't do grappa. Grappa is too high in alcohol grappa. content. Grappa. I wouldn't do a spirit. Grappa might work. But like beer, beer would be a good one on this. Beer would be nice. Beer would be very nice and, and may even be uh, appropriate for the era. So um, what are you going to do with the beer when you can't keep it cold? Uh, now, the next ingredient is uh, asafetida, which Bryson has talked a little bit about. Um, it's pungent. It, it makes other pungent spices look bland. Um, that's about all you can really say about it. Uh, once you take it out, it, it sort of overwhelms the senses. Um, it doesn't burn, but it's it's very, very powerful. Um, uh, a little bit, I felt initially like uh, the first time I smelled natto from Japan, which is fermented soybeans. It, it really, it really hits. Um, my wife insisted that it uh, live in the fridge so that it doesn't uh, stink up the kitchen. So uh, I'm going to grab that out of the fridge. Yeah, no, if you think garlic is pungent, um, asafetida is just a very unique scent on another level. I mean, it it grabs your nostrils. Um, having only had it in the mix and that I had for the uh, moldon, or sorry, Alveson forgot what it's called. Uh, something dull. Mung dal. Mung dal that Mung I made dal. in Italy yeah. a few weeks ago for the Ayurvedic cooking. Um, I mean, that, it was, it was like, the again, it was the last ingredient on the list. So I still haven't really gotten the full thing, but I can tell you just the way it's been cooking in my oven already, it is quite redolent. Yes, yes. Um, it also goes by another name, uh, which is Hing. So if you uh, haven't found it and you're gonna wind up doing this later uh, or after we record, uh, this is the version I found at an Indian spice store here in San Francisco. And it's a lot. Um, this is uh, 90 grams of uh, hing, and we wind up using uh, one and a half teaspoons. It's, it's a, it goes a long way. Um, the good news is, for those of us who are not able to, um, uh, to get it, there are uh, a lot of different substitutes you can wind up um, uh, using in this recipe, um, including a mix of something as basic as garlic and onion powder. Um, it, 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 you know, again, the, the important thing I, I feel with all cooking is to make sure that when you're doing it, you're doing it for yourself. Um, if you can't find it, if you don't like it, find a substitute really, you know, and make these recipes your own. Um, uh, that all being said, asafetida, uh, I'm just going through my notes here. Um, you can if you, you can saute garlic in ghee, which is clarified butter. Um, you can use minced leeks, <clears throat> minced leeks with minced garlic. It's another option. That's um, not even going to come close. Then, I mean, yeah, but for folks who prefer a more mild uh, uh, version, I yeah. don't see a problem with that. Um, there's also uh, you can just use straight garlic or onion powder or mix the two together, um, and uh, uh, even an onion paste uh, would uh, suffice a little bit. Chives and minced garlic. But as Bryson said, this stuff is powerful. It's the real deal. And there's nothing really quite like it that's out there. So um, the next step in getting everything ready is to grab your cooking device. I'm going to use uh, a Dutch oven. Here we go. You don't need the lid for this. It's it's actually important that uh, you don't cover it up. Um, so you grab this and throw your bird in your device. Yeah, you don't want to cover because that's what's going to get you um, a crispy chicken skin. And as everybody knows, when you get that like rubbery chicken, not any good. Yeah, yeah. A nice crisp bird. Chef's yeah, is fantastic. Yes. So we're going to do that. Uh, as you can see, I've got my spatchcocked chicken ready. There we go, ready to go. Here we are in janky cam with the chicken. 
Um, this is a Mary's chicken, which is a well-known um, uh, organic farm here in the Bay Area. So nice big bird, um, three-ish pounds, I think, was this, this one. So right that. Uh, the nickname for Asafetida is the Devil's Dung. Yes, that's one of several. One of several. That's yeah, I'm, I'm reading up more on it. I really <laughs> wish I could get it. It's probably the most accurate of them, that's for sure. All right, so bird has been placed in the Dutch oven or in your baking dish. And uh, let's see, I'm going to turn this over here. You can see my cooking station a little bit. Let me know if I need to move it. So the next thing you need to do is um, prepare the marinade. To do that, uh, grab a bowl. First off, add your wine because that's gonna be uh, the most liquid you're going to use. So we add the wine. Here we are. Fish sauce, I like to go liquids first. Uh, other folks don't. I don't know if there's a difference. We add in basically all the ingredients except for the asafetida. Uh, so celery leaf, here we go. Caraway seeds. Here we are, there we are. And black pepper. Okay. Grab a spoon, give that a good mix. Sure, we can see this. There's there we are. Okay, so got my chicken in here. We just made our mix. We're gonna pour it over the chicken. out any of the spices that are on the bottom, move them around in and on the chicken. And then comes the fun part. You need a quarter cup of lukewarm water. So we're going to do that. Add that to your to a separate bowl. Kelly, go. And the reason we're doing this is to, of course, uh, dissolve the asafetida before we put it in on the chicken. I was wondering what you were using the water in the recipe for, and of course, I didn't need to do that because I had the the spice mix. So what's right. the theory behind the doing this this way? And I'm going to grab another spoon so I can dissolve it a little bit better. Actually, a fork would be better. Grab our. Uh, I use a half teaspoon measure, so I put it in. I put in three servings of the asafoetida. So why why do we have to dissolve this beforehand? Why not just do it in the mix? I think it's so that you get an even cover. Um, I think it, it's to but make you get sure. that by the mixing with all the rest of the stuff too. It's a good question. I'm standing here with an open jar of uh, hing, so I'm going to put that in, and then we can discuss why it's important to dissolve it separately. Because, oh my gosh, that's that's a powerful smell. Uh, I really want to smell it like pure. I'm sure one of, one of our tech overlords is working on uh, smell rama right? That's that's the next thing that we don't have. Uh, yeah, they are working on that. <laughs> until then, uh, I really wanted, I mean, like I said, I remember when you mentioned this uh, to me, I guess almost a year ago. It was, it was April of last year. Wow. It was, it, it, yeah, it was crazy. crazy it, it stuck in my head because I'd never heard of it. And I, I researched it. And of course, I was really excited to finally get an opportunity 
um, to work with it because I didn't, I mean, I wasn't going and looking for, <laughs> wasn't looking that hard for it, I guess, but I mean, I was fascinated with it. And then um, it sort of fell out of my head, I guess, until the Natalie episode. Um, so. Right. <clears throat> Woo. I think, I think um, actually, uh, like a, a logical reason for why we would want to do the um, <clears throat> the hing separately is that you you want more of it on the chicken than you do um, to be under the chicken. So it's you're pouring it in, but because you've already added the the wine based marinade, it's going to sit on top of the chicken more, and it's going to flavor uh, I think more of the skin. Uh, than otherwise. But anyway, we've got it mixed. We're going to tip it over. What, why do you think uh, it's separate? I, I still can't figure that one out. Um, I mean, again, it's perhaps, you know, what it is, is it has less to do with the powder. And probably when you get more of like from the actual recipe, because back then they probably didn't have it in a powder form. It was right. like the, the actual herb itself. And you probably wanted to soak it so you didn't get like bites of something that was like really strong. Sure. And soaking it, you got something that was naturally diluted. That makes sense. Well, frankly, I would love bites like that. I, uh, I migrated a couple of years ago to uh, cooking with whole cloves of garlic because I really oh, like yeah. whole you know, bite after it's been caramelized and it cooks in my meals, as opposed to trying to like spread it through the meal. I mean, it still spreads, but I just like those bites too. So sure. Right. No, I'm, I'm, Not everybody is this crazy. I'm the same way. I'm very lucky with Lady Danger that she has a very deep appreciation of garlic. So uh, Lady we, Danger is his wife. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Like that. Sorry. Uh, my wife's middle name actually is Danger. And so you have to use that one all the time, right? Oh, yeah. Her middle name is Danger. Oh, yeah. Her middle name really is Danger, legally. So not from her parents, but um, uh, uh, when she was in uh, Texas getting her architecture degree, uh, she had to encounter a Texas judge there. And the situation unfolded, and her name was legally changed to Danger. I, obviously, that's her story to tell, but that that's sounds like a story. Yes. Exactly. There's obviously much more to that. Okay, so we have our oven preheated to 450. We have our bird. I'm actually going to bring Janky Cam, stealing that title from a friend of mine over, so you can all see what this looks like. There's the bird and the marinade. And then open your oven, stick it in, set your timer for 45 minutes. Um, if you have one of these wonderful devices, it is a thermometer that is, dig whoop, that is digital <laughs> and will give you an instant read on the temperature of the meat when you stick it in. So really, really excellent for determining uh, whether your oven is cooking at the temperature you want, uh, never mind what the dial says. Uh, ultimately, after 40 to 45 minutes, you want the interior of the bird to be around uh, 165 in freedom units and or 74 degrees Celsius in, in real numbers. Freedom units. I haven't heard that one before. I, I, I just can't with this stuff anymore. It's like, why, why, why are we still not using... Celsius and base 10 is beyond me. I like Fahrenheit, but I'm totally on board with meters. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Although I, I was a, a strongly admonished for setting the car odometer to kilometers. So. Oh, Lady Danger does not like kilometers? She pointed out something about making quick math judgments in your head while also going 70 miles an hour. And there was also something about being a uh, motorcycle rider and knowing better and being more safety focused. There were a lot of words. So anyway, 
one of the nice things about this dish, um, which I have honestly never made before, um, is that I think uh, it, it can go really well with any number of uh, sides, whether you're doing um, a rice or a rice pilaf or some other kind of grain. Um, you can do uh, a bed of spinach with it. You can really sort of make it whatever you want, which is fantastic. What do you have in mind? Bryson? Yeah, so what I did is um, I quartered onions and potatoes and I have it cooking under the bed of the chicken. So the juices from the chicken are come down and soak into that. And then I'm going to toss that with a bed of uh, arugula. Great. That sounds great. I'm doing a, a, an arugula uh, spinach mix. Arugula spinach mix. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. When you say mix, I was thinking of like, you're going to dip the chicken in the mix, but you're, you're just putting the two together as sort of like a side vegetable. Yes. Yes. Or actually a bed of it under um, the meat, but yes. So, so I have... Probably about another five-ish minutes for my chicken to be done. Okay. So um, you've, got, you've got free play now about whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> uh, uh, well, sleep deprivation is a is a seriously boring topic for anyone who's not going through it. Well, uh, uh, that's tied to having a baby. Yes. Context. Yeah. Context that, is important. That 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 is. Uh, I might have been bearing the lead there. I, I think he's just come home from uh, a day at the office, so. Um, we're very, uh, if he's, if he's not in a bad mood, we'll bring him on board and show him off. Um, very important when you do this, not to confuse the chicken with the baby. Do not put the baby in the oven. This is critical. Um, but yes, so, uh, Juliana and I had, uh, our first son in June. Uh, he's actually eight months old today, which is great. Um, and for the most part, we're, we've actually been very surprised at how relatively easy it's been. Um, I mean, nothing's easy with a newborn, but uh, we did sleep training in December and he uh, took to it very well and now sleeps 10 to 12 hours a night um, at eight months old, which is pretty good. Uh, I just got a text from Lady Danger. She says that she can smell the chicken from the sidewalk <laughs> you can tell her it's my fault because you had the asset fetida open for at least 30 seconds <laughs> as opposed to immediately transferring it to the, the dilution chamber yeah um she's used to me pointing out other people's flaws and doesn't think very highly of it so um we'll see well, I, if look, she I look forward to meeting her someday like I yes. said, yeah I, no i i, I have the uh, COVID Zoom wedding uh, watch. It's as far as I, as close as I got. We're we're hoping once things uh, are safer to actually have a a uh, an in person celebration, you know, for folks. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if it'll be around the same time of year or whatever or same location, but just doing something so that we can get people together. And um, although. One of the incredible things about it was because we know people in countries all around the world, uh, we were able to have people attend from all over. Um, we didn't have to worry about a guest list. We didn't have to worry about, um, you know, figuring out who was going to sit where. Just everybody came. And, you know, it was really nice to be able to have 300 people at your wedding and not have to pay for 300 plates of, you know, rubberized chicken or lukewarm fish. So that's good. Well, I will be on your coast in uh, the beginning of May. Sure. For Wild West Hack and Fest. Oh, great. I'll be there in June for RSA. Yeah. Um, I think I'm also going to be in Los Angeles in June again. And then I think I'm in Los Angeles again in October, but that one is pending me getting to go to Brazil. So, no. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll make it well, work. I'm going to be on your coast at least three times in the next whatever number of months for work. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, uh, one of the nice things about having the baby during COVID has been we haven't had to worry about do we travel with him or not? The answer is just no, you don't travel. <laughs> well, there are I mean, so many awesome places in driving distance to where you are, too. Yeah, let me let me quickly see uh, while we've got a few more seconds if he's available to join us. 
All right. Any uh, questions in the chat about this evening's trip back in time on your plate? He's right, though. I mean, like I said, mine was very fragrant when I uh, had it in the oven here, but it's now the fragrant and the scent's dropping. Oh, there we go. Here we are. Hello. <laughs> yeah, he's like, whatever, dude. Uh, well, so he's he's not I, wearing I his cyber. His attention. He's not wearing his cybercrime onesie, uh, which he does have, uh, but. Other than that, he's he's ready. He's ready for screen time. He desperately wants to touch the keyboard. He's not allowed. <laughs> he's not allowed. Hmm. Huh. <laughs> I know it stinks in the kitchen, huh? Yeah. All right. We'll give you back to mommy and grandma. Almost there. Oh. See, it's funny because he corrected me. I posted it as fourth century, and he said it's actually fifth century. But let's see what he says when he comes back. I mean, he's just going to say that's whatever he saw. Let's find out. All right. Um, so somebody in chat noted that their research turns up that the chicken is actually from first century Rome. Wow. That's amazing. It, it, I, I really enjoy these historical uh, uh, recipes and, and they're, they're, they're ways of looking into our own past and how we used to do things that we just wouldn't have access to otherwise. And it, it's a very nice, you know, uh, tangible connection to to how we used to be. Yeah, two, two dishes that immediately jumped to my head when I think about historical food is uh, one is brick chicken, where they would literally... Yeah put bricks on the chicken to cook it on coals. Yeah. It would cook under pressure. And then the second uh, is, um, I forget what it's called, the, the Mongolian style, because that actually when mm. Genghis Khan was, you know, traveling the, the con traveling, conquering the continent, right. um, they used to cook the meat on their shields. So you yep. just throw the meat on the shield and the sh that was your grill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Apicius wrote the first known cookbook and the recipe was in there. Wow. That's so great. You are making a dish that comes from the first known cookbook of time. Although that, I don't know if I believe that either. Cause I can't imagine that the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians didn't put something. Well, I'm, I'm sure also given the, the, the Chinese propensity for, for noting everything that yeah. they had, they had uh, recipes detailed. Um, I was in Beijing once in you know, a long time ago, and uh, I was at a restaurant that specialized in t in in the uh, seven was it no it was the eighteenth century dishes of the Qing Dynasty. So dishes from the seventeen hundreds that used to be served to the emperor, and it, it it was a real trip because they had noted everything. So given that they have a, a an historical. Um, interest in doing that and have been doing it for a very long time. I'm sure there are other recipes that are older, but given that this is one of the oldest and one that we can do fairly simply is just, I think it's great. Um, I'm actually was thinking about the, the Chinese and why they might not have had it is because um, how splintered China was for so long and, mm. and all of the basically like conquering back and forth um, probably is what destroyed a lot of those kinds of documents. Um, yeah, Shannon, I, I, I believe you you Googled for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, no, no criticism here on anybody's uh, scholarship. Right. right. Um, yeah. Parthia was part of ancient Persia. Yeah, that was the part where I was thinking about why it would have been documented around that time. Because um, if you recall, that's when um, the Romans, just before the turn of the millennium, uh, threw... I think probably about 200 AD is when it started to recede. Um, that's where they had conquered most of that part of the Mediterranean. And mm -hmm. so that's likely when those the introduction of that spice back to, you know, the core of Italy to start to become part of Roman cuisine. Sure. I've got all the history knowledge. <laughs> now trying to tie it to food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yep. I think I'm ready.
All right. So I'm going to take mine out. Yeah. And that's the point we get to take a screenshot because we will both have two chickens to show off. Which is pretty impressive. Well, nearly simultaneous chickens. Yeah, so the trick that I did for this to try to time this is I threw it in about an hour before the show at uh, 2.50. Oh. I really like a slow cook. And then my yeah. plan was, um, since I was also going in with the potatoes, I didn't want to cook it at 4.50 the whole time because the potatoes would burn. But I just right. wanted just enough time. So uh, let me get the screenshot up. Let me grab mine. So I did I did this the uh, the uh, janky way. I simply just did a second bird and had it finished before we got on camera. Not the janky way. You were going for production value, which I appreciate. Well, you know, it can't be wrong all the time. <laughs> all right, let's see. I'm, I'm going to pull this over oh, here. Just... All right, well, you got to get in there with it. Uh, I got to be in the shot with the chicken. Got to be in the shot. All right, hold on. Hold on. We'll, we'll figure this out. Make this work. Now, I should be able to angle that. Here we are. Oop, there we are. Ready? Yep. Ah, do one more. Do one more because my, my head moved. Oh, all right, hold on. I'm going to. Sorry. Now you're dealing with a photography. There. So I'm going to do another shot there. All right. Okay. Good. Now mine looks so pretty, right? Yeah. Nice job. <laughs> uh, there we go. Ah. Ah. All right. Um, take us out. What do we donate to and how? Society for Professional Journalists, spj.org. Throw them your money. We need more and better journalists, and we need them to keep doing their thing. All right. Seth, great to see you again. You too, Bryson. Uh, to the every you without, the, uh, without the beard. Yeah, I shaped it all off uh, actually that April for raising a ton of money for women's cyber jitsu. I remember. Um, tune in next week. We're going to have a special staff episode. So uh, we're going to announce our newest staff member joining the Unicorn Chef group. So on top of Caitlin and Mike, we have a surprise guest. And we are going to have a special themed show for your loved one. Very cool.